Welcome. My name is Vitaly Mirtens. I'm one of our electrophysiology nurse practitioners at Boulder Heart. We are so happy to be doing these talks again for our community to share our knowledge with you. And before we dive into the details about atrial fibrillation, I wanted to just share a little bit more about our AFib clinic at Boulder Heart. A couple of years ago, we recognized a need in our community to pull together all of the different resources that we have at Boulder Community Health that we're utilizing to evaluate and treat patients with atrial fibrillation and cardiac arrhythmias in general. We decided to base the model for our program on the American College of Cardiology Centers of Excellence for Atrial Fibrillation model. And in order to do that, we took a step back and we connected with providers across our institution and across our health system. We identified all of the different resources that we have available to us within the system. And we developed a really streamlined approach to treating patients with atrial fibrillation in our community. Our goals for this program are really to improve quality of care. We want the best quality of care for our community. And we find that that starts with implementing evidence-based practice and focusing on a really holistic approach, a whole patient-centered approach. We want to improve access to care in our atrial fibrillation clinic. And we want to make sure that we are utilizing what we call shared decision-making, or decision-making that focuses on what is best for any given individual. You'll hear more tonight about atrial fibrillation, and it's a complicated beast. It is not straightforward in terms of the different risk factors or conditions that increase our risk for developing atrial fibrillation, and it's not straightforward in terms of deciding which treatment options are appropriate for any given individual. Our goal is to be able to take a look at our patients from a head to toe approach. We evaluate all of the different factors that are playing a role in your atrial fibrillation. And then we work together as a team. Um, we work with our cardiology group, and you'll get to hear from three of our wonderful physicians tonight. And we also work with many, many subspecialists throughout our institution to provide this highest quality level of care. Dr. Anderson is going to talk more about the lifestyle factors that play a role in atrial fibrillation, which is hugely critical in the evaluation and the recommendations that we make. And you'll hear Dr. Iyengar and Dr. Aznarov talk about some of the innovative treatment options that we do have available for our atrial fibrillation patients. We want, as the Atrial Fibrillation Clinic at Boulder Heart, to be your resource. You can reach out to us with questions, with concerns, whether you are established with us as a patient or not. Our phone number is 303-443-AFib, and we really are here for you. So without further ado, I will turn over the presentation. So I'm Dr. Maria Anderson, um, a cardiac electrophysiologist or heart rhythm specialist. And in addition to that, I also have a board certification in what's called lifestyle medicine. That's a newer field that focuses on all the factors in our lives that can play a role in diseases and in health. And so I'd like to go over a series of those and, and all the information we have about how they impact atrial fibrillation. Tonight, you'll hear a lot of the details about how chaotic atrial fibrillation is and learn about the many different treatments uh, for this complex problem. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation or if you're just at this talk, it can feel overwhelming. There are so many different factors that come to play and so many different treatment options. It can really be uh, it can really lead to a feeling of almost powerlessness, uh, that you're just sort of at the, the will of the doctors taking care of you to just tell you what to do. Well, what I'd like to tell you is that you have the power to improve your atrial fibrillation. In addition to all the many things you'll hear about tonight that we can do for you, there are a whole list of things that are within your power to take action on. Uh, lifestyle measures, and I'll go over what I mean by those, uh, improve freedom from atrial fibrillation, by which I mean 
the length of time you can go between any episodes of atrial fibrillation. They can prevent atrial fibrillation from progressing from paroxysmal, which is where atrial fibrillation comes and goes, to what's called persistent atrial fibrillation, when a person just stays in atrial fibrillation. It's easier to treat and address the kind that comes and goes rather than the persistent, and lifestyle measures can help people stay in that episodic uh, group. In addition, Somewhat surprisingly, lifestyle measures are so powerful that they make even the most effective procedure we have, ablation of atrial fibrillation, which you'll hear about tonight, much more effective um, than if we do the procedure without folks uh, being able to take advantage of lifestyle changes as well. And really importantly, the single biggest thing we worry about with atrial fibrillation is that it greatly increases a person's risk for stroke and lifestyle measures can decrease that risk. There have been a variety of different studies published, especially over the last five years, about the importance of lifestyle modification for atrial fibrillation. From that article that I just uh, showed the front page of, they summarize a lot of these recent trials. And by a trial, uh, what I mean is that Groups of uh, scientists and physicians did what we would call an intervention, where they took a group who um, were the control and did not change things much, with another group who they asked to do something. And then they evaluated its effect in these cases on atrial fibrillation. So these five trials, um, all of which were released in the past uh, 10 years or so, found first that uh, folks who were able to lower their waist circumference and or their body mass index had greatly decreased atrial fibrillation frequency, uh, percentage of time that they're in atrial fibrillation, uh, the symptoms of atrial fibrillation improved, and just overall, people felt a, a much higher sense of well-being. Similarly, procedural success, and by that I mean the fibrillation of uh, ablation that you'll hear about, they found in folks who did lifestyle modification um, that they had a great increase in the efficacy or success of this uh, invasive procedure. Further, folks who were able to lose 3% uh, of their uh, excess weight, 3 to 9% of weight, or greater than 10% of weight also had a great decrease in the amount of atrial fibrillation that they had, as well as the severity of that atrial fibrillation. Um, and then finally, the last big trial that was published found that, again, this progression of atrial fibrillation from episodic to long-lasting uh, was really staved off and improved when people were able to make successful lifestyle uh, modifications. So what are those factors that you can modify and we can help with that? Well, they are excess weight and physical activity, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, diabetes, high cholesterol, alcohol use, and smoking. There's a variety of different ways that each of these lifestyle uh, factors can impact atrial fibrillation. And those include especially this concept of inflammation where uh, the heart becomes inflamed from a variety of different chemicals that excess fat releases or that high blood pressure causes the release of. And that can stretch out the upper chambers and lead to atrial fibrillation. So first I'll go over dietary pattern in atrial fibrillation. On one end of the spectrum, what we refer to as the standard Western diet is probably the diet most likely to cause atrial fibrillation. What I mean by that is a diet that is unfortunately very low in whole foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, and beans and legumes, and rather much higher in processed foods like processed meats or canned foods, uh, or what we would call junk food. And that diet can do that, again, by causing inflammation, by damaging the blood vessels, and in diabetes, uh, 
high glucose, which can result from a standard Western diet, can also damage the heart cells as well as its blood vessels. On the opposite end of the spectrum, as we get a diet that is much more whole food, and we're learning plant-based, that is shown to improve atrial fibrillation by doing the opposite of a standard Western diet, decreasing inflammation, healing blood vessels, regulating blood sugar, and importantly, lowering the amount of fat on the surface of the heart. Excess weight increases atrial fibrillation, even independent of exactly how the excess weight uh, grew. That happens from a variety of different mechanisms, including this epicardial adipose. That, again, is just the fat that sits on the surface of the heart. That leads to inflammation, damages the heart cells, and it also, excess weight, increases other risk factors for atrial fibrillation and stroke, including sleep apnea and high blood pressure. So as we talked about a couple slides back, losing about 10% of weight when it's needed can greatly improve uh, atrial fibrillation burden. So what is this epicardial adipose? We're learning a great deal about that over the past few years. And on this heart, you see that what's in yellow um, is labeled as EAT. That stands for epicardial adipose tissue. And then the uh, redder is the heart muscle, the myocardium. Several studies has fa have found that the more epicardial adipose tissue you have, the more inflammatory chemicals, what we call cytokines and chemokines, these crazy things will cause actual damage to the cells that are supposed to be transmitting electricity and allowing the heart to contract in an orderly and appropriately forceful manner. So in this diagram, um, on the top on the left, you see a picture of the left upper chamber. That's where a lot of atrial fibrillation comes from, and that's where a great deal of this epicardial adipose tissue sits. On the bottom part of the screen, you can see a list of all these crazy abbreviations, IL-6, TNF-alpha, VGF. What those are are all different inflammatory chemicals that can damage and even scar the, uh, the atrial cells or the upper chamber cells. I like to think of this epicardial adipose tissue like a sponge. It's just sitting on top of the surface of the heart, dripping these inflammatory chemicals onto the heart and causing damage and resulting in atrial fibrillation. Well, what about smoking? Smoking is really a strong risk factor for atrial fibrillation, and it makes it five times more likely. Independently increases a person's risk of stroke, and it does that via a variety of different mechanisms, including damaging heart cells and blood vessels, and again, this ever-present inflammation. Alcohol, I'm sad to say, um, is also a significant risk factor for developing atrial fibrillation. Even one drink a day can increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. Um, and as uh, alcohol, uh, daily alcohol increases, so does the incidence of atrial fibrillation. So in people who suffer from atrial fibrillation, if they drink, cutting back, reducing their alcohol can help their atrial fibrillation burden. Exercise is an interesting and important risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Folks who don't find themselves able to exercise, um, unfortunately, have a high burden of atrial fibrillation. When folks uh, exercise, uh, very aggressively for many hours a week, more than about five hours a week at a very aggressive pace, that is also associated with a risk of atrial fibrillation. So this sort of baby bear zone where not too little exercise and not too much exercise is where you wanna be in terms of this rhythm. And we call that a U-shaped curve. Here's what I mean by that. At the far left of the curve, folks who are sedentary uh, tend to have the most atrial fibrillation. As the exercise increases, um, as you go to the right of this uh, slide, um, AFib decreases progressively until you get to this point where you're vigorously exercising about 300 minutes or five hours in a week. Then 
that itself can cause damage to the heart cells and the blood vessels and cause stretch that can lead to atrial fibrillation. Stress in AFib is something I get asked about a lot, and it's sort of a vicious cycle. Both physical and emotional stress can trigger atrial fibrillation, and conversely, atrial fibrillation can cause symptoms of physical and emotional stress. Stress reduction is shown to improve atrial fibrillation as well as that global well-being sense. So things like walking, hiking, various forms of meditation, yoga, can all help decrease stress burden and consequently atrial fibrillation. Sleep could not be more important in, in the development of atrial fibrillation and all these lifestyle factors are really strongly interconnected. Ideally, folks who can get seven to eight hours of restful sleep is associated with the least amount of atrial fibrillation. Poor sleep quality increases AFib, and things like alcohol, excess weight, and stress, of course, worsen sleep, and then that can, um, in this sort of vicious cycle, create more atrial fibrillation. Sleep apnea is a major cause of AFib. In an AFib clinic like ours, approximately 85% of folks who come in are found to have sleep apnea. Now, if sleep apnea is present, but not diagnosed and then treated, even our most successful means of treating atrial fibrillation with atrial fibrillation ablation, the success drops from about 70 or 75% with a single procedure down to 50%. That's a really dramatic drop so we find it very important to look for, it, for sleep apnea, and then if it's present, to encourage people to get treatment for that. Furthermore, folks who have sleep apnea progress more steadily from that episodic kind of uh, AFib into the persistent kind. The treatments for sleep apnea include weight loss if it's needed. A lot of sleep apnea, although not all, comes in the setting of excess weight and obesity. And then CPAP. Uh, which is the mask that helps keep your airways open when you sleep, and that can greatly improve the amount of uh, AFib people suffer. So this slide just shows that there's this complex interaction between all of these different lifestyle measures and um, how we can help people help themselves for the atrial fibrillation while we're also offering all the state-of-the-art treatments for atrial fibrillation. So in conclusion, while it can seem overwhelming to get this diagnosis, there are many things that you can do to improve your own atrial fibrillation. And those include reaching a weight where your waist is smaller than your hips. Uh, that's often a helpful measure for folks uh, to use and doesn't even require a scale. Eating a diet that's high in whole foods, especially whole plant foods, and low in processed foods is very useful. Quitting smoking and avoiding alcohol can really help that burden as well. And reducing stress, considering meditation, doing yoga is a benefit independently also. And then finally, moderate exercise, ideally up to three to five hours per week um, is the perfect amount of exercise to keep your AFib burden low. This is my dog who <laughs> is enjoying nature and keeping her stress low while exercising. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sam Asnarov. Uh, just like Dr. Anderson, I'm uh, a cardiac electrophysiologist at Boulder Heart. Um, I really want to second what Dr. Anderson said. It is really important to address some of the risk factors having to do with AFib, and it's, it's really important to look at this not as a burden, but kind of a sense of empowerment, that uh, the power to kind of move the curve on AFib is in your hands. But there does come a time where you might need help from us as well to help manage your atrial fibrillation. So we're going to talk about some of the options for uh, what can we do to help your AFib burden. So we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we're going to start with uh, first AFib basics, just some foundational concepts underlying atrial fibrillation. Uh, then we're going to move on to 
when we meet a patient, how do we put together a big picture strategy for their therapeutic approach? Um, in whom might we consider solely rate control and in whom might we consider pursuing rhythm control? And then once we've decided on rhythm control options, uh, we're gonna finish out this portion of the talk with uh, some, uh, some of the approaches to how we actually try to control AFib, either by medication or with some procedural options. So we're gonna start out with just basically what is atrial fibrillation? Well, to understand atrial fibrillation, you first have to understand heart physiology. So the lower chambers of the heart are called the ventricles. Uh, that is the actual, uh, those are the actual pumps in the heart. That's what generates a pulse. When you feel your heart beating, you're feeling the ventricles contract. Those are critical to the heart's function. Without ventricular function, you don't have a heartbeat. The atria are in turn the upper chambers of the heart. Those are more of the support chambers of the heart. So they do a lot of regulatory functions and they help coordinate timing of the heart's chambers, of the uh, ventricles. And so what we'll be talking about is what happens when the atria are misbehaving and we start to lose these regulatory capacities uh, that they they bring to the heart's function. So zooming into the atria on a tissue level, this is what atrial fibrillation looks like. So AFib is a chaotic, kind of disorganized electrical rhythm. Um, I really like to show this picture to my patients uh, because it kind of helps you get an idea of what we're up against. Every other kind of arrhythmia that Dr. Anderson or I might go after has some sort of place inside the heart where it either originates from or a circuit that it follows, uh, whereas this truly is a complete, uh, you know, I sometimes like to call it an electrical riot. The, what, what happens in atrial fibrillation is that we, we tend to see loss of heart efficiency that's, loss, uh, that's related to the loss of the timing, reservoir, and pressure optimization functions in the atria. But the good news about AFib is that it is not an immediately life-threatening arrhythmia. Because the atria serve a support function, um, AFib can be uncomfortable. It can certainly cost heart efficiency, but it is not the kind of thing that is a true life-threatening emergency every time it occurs. Now, there are some consequences to atrial fibrillation. So let's see if we can get this mouse to work. And maybe not, oh, here it comes. Okay, so if you look at these EKGs at the top of the screen, on the left side, I have just a few beats of what's called sinus rhythm. And on the right side, for comparison, at the same scale, I have what's called atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. So rapid heart rates, and, and you know, even if you've never looked at an EKG before, you can tell that there's a whole lot more going on on that strip. So rapid heart rates are the most immediate uh, and for a lot of people, kind of the, the first sign of, hey, something's wrong. Uh, this is what we call palpitations, the sense of something's up with my heartbeat. It may be that it's irregular, it may be that it's fast. Sometimes people say, you know, I have, I'm having trouble putting my finger on it, but something's off in here. Um, Palpitations can be really annoying, and they can actually be really disturbing uh, for patients, especially when they don't know what the source of those palpitations is, if it's the first time that somebody might have experienced them. But the really significant complication of AFib that we worry about has to do more with loss of heart efficiency. Um, so those symptoms might manifest as shortness of breath, fatigue, chest discomfort, and then there is a risk of heart failure over the long term as a result of that loss of heart efficiency. And then really, I think Dr. Anderson already mentioned this, I'm gonna mention it, um, Dr. Iyengar's entire talk really has to do with this. Stroke is the most devastating complication of atrial fibrillation, and so one of the really big therapeutic targets for us is to prevent stroke. And so just a uh, picture of what we're looking at on the EKG kind of made possible to evaluate with your own eyes. So this is a patient undergoing open heart surgery and their heart is in atrial fibrillation. So just like we had mentioned, there are the ventricles, which are the actual pumping chambers, and then there are the atria, which are the support chambers. So the ventricular irregular and fast heartbeat can be visualized kind of by watching the motion here. 
And that's what's represented by all of these complexes at the top of the EKG. But then you can also see that there's this component of the heart here that's actually going a heck of a lot faster than even this component here. So this is the atrium with its electrical storm. And this is the ventricle that's responding to that electrical storm with loss of coordinated, nice rhythmic function. So the AFib timeline, this is a really important concept that, again, I think Dr. Anson kind of alluded to, uh, but we're really going to dig into this. So AFib is a progressive disease. Age is one of the most important factors when it comes to the risk of atrial fibrillation. And that has in part to do with normal aging. However, on top of just normal aging, there is also a significant amount of wear and tear that might, uh, that might accumulate in a given patient's heart that has to do with risk factors for atrial fibrillation that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail here in just a second. But then the really interesting concept for us is also, you know, we certainly we want to target general cardiovascular risk factors and bring down this curve that we're looking at that shows more and more and more risk of AFib as somebody ages. But then there's also this dynamic risk factor having to do with AFib. So we say uh, among ourselves that AFib begets AFib, that the more AFib a patient has experienced in their lifetime, the more likely they are to have their next episode of AFib. And what you're seeing in this graph, in this kind of hypothetical patient model, is that during episodes of atrial fibrillation, there's actually dynamic remodeling happening in the heart that makes AFib more likely in turn. And then when we intervene on these AFib episodes, and I'm losing my mouse again here, when we intervene on these episodes, we can actually see, again, some dynamic loss of that remodeling and a reduction in this AFib risk. And so you can see this kind of sawtooth pattern that has to do here up top, it's correlating with episodes of atrial fibrillation uh, that then hopefully we can turn back the clock on or hopefully prevent progression of this. And what basically this comes down to is that if we get our hands on somebody's AFib in later stages, we still have some of the same tools available to us, but those tools may be less effective or we may have to use them in a more aggressive fashion in order to achieve the same basic result. So risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So structural heart disease, so again, I, I just said that age is kind of the, the constant risk factor, but I wish we could turn back the clock for all of us, but all of us are getting older every day, so we can't really do anything about that. However, the dynamic things that we actually can address are things like structural heart disease. So if somebody has heart failure, valvular heart disease, if they've suffered a heart attack, those are certainly predispos uh, predisposing factors for atrial fibrillation. Cardiac risk factors, so things that haven't actually damaged the heart but are wearing the heart and potentially uh, leading to risk of some of these structural issues. So high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea. Some non-cardiac medical conditions like thyroid gland imbalance, lung disease, or substance use. And then there are multiple self-limited precipitants. So it's not uncommon for us to see somebody have their first and potentially only ever episode of atrial fibrillation when they're in the ICU dealing with a severe illness or trauma. Um, that, in my mind, doesn't necessarily make that individual patient an AFib patient, although we certainly want to keep an eye on them going forward after they've recovered from that acute illness because we may see AFib out of them in the future. So moving on to how do we put together a treatment strategy? So there are two really broad concepts here. There's rate control and then there's rhythm control. So rate control has to do with some of these irregular and rapid heart rates associated with atrial fibrillation. Now, when we talk about rate control, what we're trying to do is slow the ventricular response to AFib, but not really treat the AFib itself. It is the least complicated option that we have, and it's appropriate for people who have very early stage AFib. For example, somebody that might come see us after their only episode ever. We might say, you know, while we're keeping an eye on this, we may want to get you on some medication as an insurance policy so that if AFib recurs, you at least won't have rates that are quite as fast. But I'm not sure that you're ready for much more advanced and aggressive options. On the other side, it may be more useful for kind of later stage patients who are medically frail and in whom we're worried about potentially exposing them to side effects of medications or complications of a procedure because we don't think they have a whole lot of reserve. 
Um, it is the least effective option because we're not really doing anything about the AFib itself. And it doesn't slow the progression of AFib. Um, but of course, hopefully, while we're addressing rate control, we can also talk about some of the lifestyle factors to help slow the progression of, A of AFib, as Dr. Anders was talking about. Now, rhythm control, on the other hand, we're actually directly trying to suppress atrial fibrillation with this strategy. We do know that it can prevent AFib progression over time. It treats the symptoms of atrial fibrillation itself, as opposed to just some of the fast heart rates associated with atrial fibrillation. And we know that we can prevent some of the consequences of atrial fibrillation over time. So reduced risk of heart failure. Uh, there is some indication that there is a reduced risk of stroke when we treat AFib with rhythm control, although it's not quite enough to say, oh, okay, now we don't have to worry about stroke anymore. We still have to think about a stroke prevention strategy. And then I have a question mark next to longer survival, and that is because historically we've thought of atrial fibrillation as being the kind of disease that we can help people live better, but we can't necessarily help people live longer by treating their AFib. Although in recent years we've been able to prove with scientific trials that there are certain subsets, subpopulations of patients where we actually can see longer survival given a specific treatment strategy. So all of this is really exciting and kind of up in the air for now, but I think in general we tend to focus more on symptoms than actually prolonging survival. Um, rhythm control options come in two different flavors. So we have antiarrhythmic drugs and we have ablation procedures. Both of these are really designed to suppress the triggers of atrial fibrillation. So how do we choose? You're sitting in front of me as a patient. How do I choose between rate and rhythm control? Well, the first thing to understand is we don't necessarily have to choose. A lot of times we'll use both strategies as complementary tools. Uh, rhythm control is helpful for people who have significant symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And again, you know, I've got fatigue here highlighted because that's an important factor for me because that says loss of heart efficiency. So whereas, again, palpitations, lightheadedness may be more of an annoying thing that the patient might want to deal with, and I certainly want to help them deal with that, fatigue to me is kind of one of those really exciting symptoms that says this is a heart that's actually struggling to provide blood flow the way that this patient's body needs. Um, earlier but progressive AFib, so when we see an acceleration in AFib burden over time, that says some of that dynamic remodeling from atrial fibrillation is starting to take place. We need to be thinking about trying to flatten that curve. When rate control isn't working, so people that are still symptomatic despite rate control, or in patients in whom we're having trouble getting their rates under control, then we say, hey, it's time to really focus on the AFib itself. Um, AFib-related heart failure, again, kind of a big deal, and that's why we tend to be aggressive about it. Now, choosing rate control only, as in choosing not to pursue rhythm control for a patient, in which situation is that helpful? Well, patients who are unable to tolerate some of these more aggressive rhythm control therapies that we have to offer, or patients in permanent atrial fibrillation, patients who have been in AFib for potentially years, or sometimes somebody comes to see me and they've been in AFib for decades. At that point, that remodeling has had a chance to take hold to the point where we are unlikely to be able to really do anything meaningful for that AFib. And so that's where we tend to focus on the rate control aspect of things. So what are our rhythm control options? So we'll start with antiarrhythmic medications, medical rhythm control. And you know, it's important to understand in pretty much every avenue in medicine, we usually don't have a perfect option. There's always some, gonna be some pros and cons. Um, this is really apparent when we are choosing antiarrhythmic medications. So the most effective drugs, unfortunately, also have the most side effects. So amiodarone, I like to call our best and worst drug. It is the strongest drug I have to offer somebody to help control AFib. Unfortunately, it also has a lot of long-term side effects. Now, by long-term, I don't mean that if you take this medicine today and you develop a side effect, it'll be with you for life. What I mean is that after years on that medication, we can see this kind of insidious, slow, chronic progression of some of these side effects. So we can see physical signs of lung damage. We can see liver disease. We can see thyroid gland imbalance and some neuropathies. There are also some minor kind of not as serious issues with this medication over the long term. But what's important to understand is, well, we recognize those potential issues. And so we actually routinely monitor for the development of these side effects in those patients in whom we think that amiodarone is the best option for them. 
Um, the nice thing about amiodarone is actually very well tolerated in the short term. So if we have somebody who, for example, our ICU patient who is fighting for their life and happens to have AFib as a result of their critical illness, amiodarone may be a great option for that patient because we're just trying to get them through the next few days or weeks or maybe a couple of months, but we're not necessarily counting on this as their long-term option. There are multiple drugs that I would kind of consider the mid-range options that actually have minimal long-term toxicity. Um, however, their potential cost is that they may be pro-arrhythmic. So as we tilt the balance away from atrial fibrillation, we may actually start to see some other potentially fairly significant arrhythmias come into play. And so because of that, these drugs, I like to say, come with some homework to make sure that we're using them safely. We might have to do some prior testing to make sure that a particular drug is safe to use. Generally, that comes in the form of a cardiac stress test. Or we may have to do monitored loading in the hospital. What that means is a commitment on our part and the patients to spend two nights, three days in the hospital for the first few doses of that medication to make sure that we're tolerating that medication load. Most of the time, it's just that. It's just homework to make sure that we're starting it safely. Occasionally, we actually find that a patient does not prove to be a good candidate for that medication, and we have to say, you know, it, we need to back off. This is not a good idea. Um, and then finally, we have dronetarone, which is a cousin of amiodarone that actually like to say is our worst and best antiarrhythmic. So it actually has the least side effects in the long term. It has no proarrhythmic properties. It's very easy to use. We can write you the prescription and say you can start taking this medication. However, it's also the least effective option for control of AFib. So it does have its niche in patients who have relatively early stage AFib where we want rhythm control. This is a great option because you don't necessarily need a sledgehammer to go after that patient's AFib. You can treat it with a selective, not very aggressive treatment. And that's where this drug has its uses. So the alternative to ablation, or excuse me, to medical therapies is the ablation procedure. It's the invasive management approach. So a little bit of kind of background on what it is that we're targeting here. So the triggers of atrial fibrillation result in the pulmonary veins. What those are, so we're looking at a patient's atrium here, and you can see here's the left upper pulmonary vein, the left lower pulmonary vein, right upper and right lower. So this is kind of a 3D model of this individual patient's atrium. And so the ablation procedure has been used to electrically silence these triggers. So what, you've done, what we've done in this case is we've gone around the pulmonary veins on both sides and encircled them with this lesion set, we call it, where we've actually killed the heart tissue at each of these red dots to create a ring of scar that encloses that area and electrically silences the tissue in the pulmonary veins. Now, as AFib progresses, these triggers actually tend to migrate into the left atrium proper. And so in later stage atrial fibrillation, we may actually have to do more extensive trigger modification. And we may actually see less favorable AFib control, potentially even despite more aggressive therapies. So it's an invasive procedure. And therefore, ablation carries some upfront risks. On the day of the procedure, as well as for a few weeks after, we do tend to see more of, uh, more of a propensity towards procedure-related complications. However, what's really nice about this is it doesn't carry the long-term potential side effects of being on a medication for years. The other thing to keep in mind with ablation is that the lesion set actually has to take a few months to mature into electrically inert scar, and so it actually takes several months to achieve the full benefit of the procedure. How do we perform this ablation procedure? Well, it is a catheter-based approach. So as you can see on the left side of the screen here, what this is modeling is that we're placing a needle into the vein at the leg and then following that vein up into the heart. In kind of prime time use right now, we have two different treatment modalities for treating AFib. So on this prior slide, I showed you this lesion set with these red dots. That is a radio frequency ablation. So you can see that on the bottom right of the screen. So that's a point by point heating up the tissue to kill it kind of procedure. Whereas on the top right of the screen, what you see there is a cryo balloon catheter. That is a balloon that actually is inserted into the vein and then we inflate it. 
And as it makes contact all the way around the vein, as a single shot, we're able to freeze that tissue to kill it, and then we deflate the balloon, take it out of the way. So basically, both of these things are relying on what's called thermal injury to those heart muscle cells to electrically silence them. There are a lot of things in the research arena. There are a lot of things in the pre-approval arena, and there are a lot of things that have just recently been approved, but we're kind of waiting on longer term experience with. Um, but these two things have been around for years. Um, we've learned over the years how to use them more and more efficiently, so we're not doing the same old thing that we were doing 20 years ago with, say, radio frequency ablation or 10 years ago with cryo balloon ablation. Um, but these are tried, true methods that we have only improved upon little by little over time. So the ultimate goal of this procedure is to get this result here. So what we're looking at here is a voltage map, and in fact, I believe we can play this. So what we're looking at here is a voltage map of the atrium where purple is electrically active tissue, red is electrically silent tissue. And after we've gone around this patient's pulmonary veins, you can see that when we remapped with this kind of funky looking catheter that you can see in the middle of the heart, we can see that the tissue in the pulmonary veins has been electrically silenced. That is the goal of that procedure. How effective are these options? Well, historically we've said that as we reach the one year mark, so what we're looking at here is freedom from AFib going forward over time, so days on the bottom, freedom from AFib on the uh, y-axis here. So as we get to the one year mark, which is around right here, what we've historically said is that about 70% of patients have not had a single AFib recurrence after this procedure. Now, I mentioned that little by little, we've learned how to be a little bit more efficient and a little safer and things like that with this procedure. And so over time, we've actually been able to nudge that, that um, curve up a little bit to where these days, when we're dealing with certain subtypes of AFib, we can claim as much as an 85% total freedom from AFib. However, We've said that AFib is a complicated beast. And so if somebody's dealing with later stage AFib or if they have multiple untreated risk factors, there are certainly things as, a, as an individual patient we may say, you know, your likelihood of AFib control may actually be lower what we might quote the average person. However, it's also really important to understand that even in this group of patients represented by this drop off in the curve, so the people above the curve, which in this case is about one in three patients, even in those patients who have had a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, it's important to understand that after the ablation is supposed to be four. You see all these curves on the right side of the screen are pointing down. What is this? So these are recorded AFib episodes, patient reported symptomatic AFib episodes, as well as duration of episodes. And what we're seeing is that all of those things are trending downward. So it's important to acknowledge that even in people who don't get a, and I like to use this in quote, cure for their atrial fibrillation after this procedure, we still see a significantly reduced AFib burden um, even if we haven't gotten rid of their AFib. Now the other thing to, to understand is on the bottom here, we're dealing with medical rate control. So you can see that that curve actually drops off a lot faster than ablation. So you know, I like to tell people that ablation is by no means perfect. We definitely, as a, as a uh, scientific field, have a lot to do to get better control of AFib. However, ablation is by far the most effective medical management tool we have. And if we couple it with lifestyle interventions, we can really help push up that curve even higher. So for, for the conclusion of my part, I just want to thank everybody for, for listening. Um, I, it's really important for us to generate community awareness of cardiac disease. And, and those of you that are in the audience right now, I think it's important to understand that even if you don't personally have AFib, you will probably know somebody sooner or later that does. And just being aware of the fact that there are options out there, you may be able to really significantly save, uh, save or at least positively impact their life. The other thing is if you do have AFib, please don't live in denial about it because unfortunately these kind of wear and tear progressive diseases are always easier to prevent than to treat. So these lifestyle interventions, uh, interventions these medical interventions definitely are more effective if we can get, get our hands on your AFib in, it, in the earlier stages. Thank you very much.
All right, folks, thanks for sticking around for the talk tonight. And uh, basically, with, without wasting any more time, let's just, just start my talk, which is atrial fibrillation, stroke, and blood thinning medications. What else is available? My name is Shrini Iyengar. I'm an interventional cardiologist and structural heart director here at Boulder Heart. But more importantly, I'd like to just make a differentiation here. My colleagues tonight are pretty much electricians. I am a plumber. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because I'm going to be talking about AFib from a different angle. Instead of treating the symptoms of AFib, rather, I will be telling you about other sequelae or other side effects of AFib and how, as a plumber, we can go about treating it. But first and foremost, we know, as we heard tonight, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm. Top parts of the heart, the atria, don't communicate electrically properly with the bottom. Very basic, this is a plumber's view of it. Results in symptoms of shortness of breath, lightheadedness, and palpitations. So we've also gone on the causes. Number of things can cause AFib. High blood pressure, previous heart attacks, which are coronary disease, heart valves that are not working well, defects in the heart when you're born with, thyroid disease, and again, exposure to caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, and obviously there's another one with poor sleep habits, like sleep, having sleep apnea can cause these things as well. So how do you have AFib diagnosed? So first and foremost, if you have palpitations and you're racing hard at home, it may not be AFib. It may be AFib, but it may not. You need an ECG or EKG. It's mandatory because we need to know what the rhythm is like. So not every irregular heart rhythm is AFib. PVCs, APCs, skip beats can all mimic feelings of AFib. So you can have skip beats at home and it may not be AFib. It might just be skip beats from extra irregular beats that are not actually atrial fibrillation. And it does not have to be chronic. It can be short lasting or come and go. Hence the name paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So just important to keep in mind, AFib can be permanent, can be coming back, back and forth. It can come in a blue moon. The truth is though, AFib is one of those things where it could be like a boomerang. You may have it once, and then five years later, it comes back again. So just keep this in mind as we go on tonight. As my colleagues have mentioned, medications can control it. Antirhythmics can use it to keep you in a normal rhythm. Cardioversion, which is giving you a little bit of electricity. Again, promise you, you won't feel it. But again, it is giving you a shock to change you from AFib back to normal rhythm. And ablation, as we've also talked about, already talked about, can be curative in certain patients. But again, I'm not here to tell you about AFib in its palpitations and shortness of breath. I'm talking about the other problems AFib causes. And what's the major thing that we worry about with AFib? Stroke. So where does stroke develop in AFib? Why does it even happen? Well, again, let's go back to that first slide, what I talked about. The top chambers of your heart aren't talking to the bottom chambers. So the top chambers are quivering, basically. They're not contracting at a normal pace. They're going too fast. So what happens is blood coagulates in those chambers. And when blood coagulates, it becomes a clot. But where can a clot sit comfortably and wait for, say, an apt time to come out and cause trouble? Well, that's the left atrial appendage. It's literally like the appendix of the heart. It's a little sac that sits on the left atrium where clot can develop, blood can coagulate there. And when the heart then goes into either a normal rhythm or it goes into a slower AFib or faster AFib, that can contract the appendage and squeeze out like a tube of toothpaste, clot coming out of the heart. And that can lead to a stroke in the brain. And hence, that's why you guys see all the commercials on TV talking about, hey, do you have AFib? Maybe you are a candidate for Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, it's not because they're just showing a person's playing with their grandkids. It's about a stroke preventing them playing with their grandkids. And that's why we place patients on blood thinners. So blood thinners work excellent as long as compliance is maintained and there's no side effects. So warfarin, also known as Coumadin, is cheap. It's been around for decades. The problem is there's compliance issues. People have to watch their diet. You have to test for something called INRs or protimes to check your levels of Coumadin. And again, the newer medications, like I just mentioned, the ones you see on the commercial, the NOACs or the DOACs is what they're called, are very costly. And the problem is a lot of patients who take these medications, 
there's not really a real readily available reversal agent. So if you're bleeding on one of these medications, it's not like we can give you a medication to actively reverse it quickly. Some hospitals carry it, sometimes we don't, because it is a very costly thing to have, and not many patients are coming in with this particular issue. All the above can exacerbate bleeding. Remember, when you take a blood thinner, it can make bleeding worse. That's their job. Their job is to prevent clotting. So if you cut yourself on a blood thinner, basically it's gonna take longer for you to heal. So AFib, as we know, it's a growing problem associated with greater morbidity and mortality. Higher stroke risk for older patients, 15 to 20% of all strokes are AFib related. And after a stroke, there's greater disability compared to patients who have non-AFib related stroke. So again, strokes are debilitating. I'm mentioning that again, because a lot of patients will say to me, you know, I had a heart attack, but I recovered well from it. You know, I feel well, I'm not, I'm not doing as bad as I was before. I'm a little short of breath, but strokes are a different animal. When you knock off tissue in the brain, sometimes a patient will say, you know, hey, I feel better, but I just don't remember what I used to, or I can't really use my left arm as well as I used to, or, hey, you know what, I feel just so fatigued and lethargic because, again, my diaphragm is not expanding as well because of the stroke. Strokes can cause so many different problems because, again, our brains are complicated. So there's no such thing as a small stroke in a, in a non-important area of the brain. It's all important. So again, what do we as physicians and clinicians decide to put people on blood thinners? So a lot of patients will say, I have AFib, but I was told I don't need a blood thinner. Why is that? Well, because in medicine, we have to go by guidelines. Guidelines guide us to determine what therapy is best for patients. So we have something called a CHADS VASCOR. Literally, it's that area on the bottom there, it's an acronym, and that stands for C, congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, A with two points is a greater age than 75, D is diabetes, S is for stroke, which is two points, V is for vascular disease, which basically means carotid artery disease, peripheral arterial disease, A is age again, but since there's no two, that means one point for age over 65, so 65 to 75 gets one point. S is for basically gender, sex, Female, well, females get a point right off the bat. So when you look at this score, I know it sounds like a lot of things I've just mentioned, but as a clinician, we run this list every time a patient walks in the office, we run it through our heads what their CHADS VAS score is. And as you can see in the bottom, zero, don't really need to be on a blood thinner. One, it's kind of the gray area between aspirin or being on a blood thinner. And if you're two or greater, the guidelines state you need to be on a blood thinner like a Coumadin or a medication like an Eliquis or a Xarelto. So anticoagulant therapy carries risk of hindrance hemorrhage or death. So when you're on a blood thinner, it doesn't make you bleed, but if you should have any incident or nitis to bleed, it makes it much harder to stop. So if you have a small vessel bleed that without a blood thinner, you might've been controlled, it could transform to a life-threatening bleed on a blood thinner. So we look at this as saying, okay, we have the CHADS VAS score. Let's look at the yearly stroke risk. So you can see on the right there of the screen about if you're on a blood thinner or no blood thinner and your risk goes up every year with more risk factors. So the higher the risk factors, the more likely you are to have an event, obviously without a blood thinner on board. There is another scoring system called the HASBLED score, which we use to basically ascertain what is your risk of bleeding if you are on a blood thinner. So we utilize this as well in conjunction with the, CH the CHADS VASCOR to determine, should you be on a blood thinner? And if you are on the blood thinner, what's the risk of you bleeding on it? So again, as you see here, as your HAS blood score gets elevated, it is incredibly high how your, your bleeding risk goes. It goes from zero to 8.6 to as high as 60 if your score is a four. But again, I wanna emphasize everyone that's watching, blood thinners work. It just has to be in the right patient. So here, warfarin, excellent means of effective stroke reduction. The trouble with people taking warfarin is that you have to regulate it. So as you see there on the right side of the screen, you have to keep it within the therapeutic window. 
Two to three is the number that we get checked. For people who take warfarin, you understand, you have to get your levels checked. However, just because you're 1.8 or 1.9, close enough is not good enough. I have had patients who have had strokes with a 1.9 INR because that's how effective the medication is if it's kept within the two to three window, but how not effective it is if it's low. Also, I've had patients come in and say, my INR was five, but that just means I'm well anticoagulated. Well, let me tell you something, you are, but also you're at extreme high risk of developing bleeding issues. So it's not good to be high either. With the newer medications like the, the Eliquis, Sorelatos, Pradaxis, you don't have to check your levels. That's a big freedom for patients. Patients love that. However, patients don't like being on blood thinners and the risk of bleeding is equally there. So it's important to keep that in mind that just because you don't have to check your levels doesn't mean the bleeding risk is lower. A lot of patients who take these new medications stop. Nearly 30% stop taking it two years. And why is that? The cost? The secondary side effects of the bleeding, combination of the two, these are usually the reasons why people stop taking these medications. And as you can see, the names on the left are the actual generic names, the trade names, as I mentioned, the Xereltos, Eliquis, the Pradaxas. These are the medications that are currently prescribed, but we can see that the major bleeding rates are there, guys. Everything, there's real major bleeding rates with all of these medications. So what I want to comment on, number one is, AFib is a growing problem associated with greater morbidity and mortality of with a five times increased risk of stroke, especially if you have an elevated CHADS VAS score. If I didn't mention it early, over 90% of clots from atrial fibrillation related strokes come from the appendix of the heart, the left atrial appendage. So our current treatments with warfarin or the NOAX are effective, but many patients stop taking the medications. So anticoagulation bleeding risk compounds over time and may not be viable as a long-term solution for some patients. Again, I want to make the proviso. If you can tolerate being on a blood thinner and you have an elevated CHADS vascular and have atrial fibrillation, you should take a blood thinner. It's not an excuse not to take it because you're scared of it. If you are a good candidate, you should be on it. Now, again, this is a picture on the bottom right of the left atrial appendage, that little kind of like sac that's there, and the thing in the middle, that's actually a clot. So again, like I said, majority of the clots in AFib come from the left atrial appendage. So before I go into, well, why am I talking about something else in addition to the blood thinners? Because a lot of patients cannot take a blood thinner. A blood thinner basically, again, is for patients who don't have bleeding risks. Patients who have high fall risks, a history of GI bleeding or any other bleeding, a patient who has a high risk lifestyle, mountain climbers, farmers who are working with heavy, sharp equipment, patients who have allergic reactions to blood thinners. These are patients who do not do well on a blood thinner. So what did medicine do for these patients? Well, for the longest time, we had no option. We literally told patients, sorry, if you can't take a blood thinner and you have an elevated risk of stroke and AFib, I guess we just have to roll the dice. And that was not a good option. So into the fray came something that actually offers a pass between the rock and the hard place. And that's the Watchman procedure. The Watchman is a device that actually fits into the left atrial appendage and actually blocks it off. So what do I use that analogy as? It's like putting a cork on a bottle. Once you cork that bottle off, it's closed. So how do we do this? Well, at this time, I think we're gonna to go to the actual animation and I'll show you what the watch and procedure does. So can we go to the animation, please? So the procedure is performed through the vein in the groin that's called a common femoral vein. The catheter then goes up through the inferior vena cava, it's a vein, to the heart. We get into the heart and the patient is, you are under general anesthesia at this point, so you do not feel any of this. We make a slight puncture across the heart, again, you will not feel it, and advance a wire into the left atrium. We then place a catheter into the left atrium and place a catheter called a pigtail catheter, as you can see why it's called a pigtail, and we advance this into 
the appendage. Now, this schematic is just showing you the different forms of the appendage because God made us all different, so we all have different types of appendages. Once we put the catheter in there, we inject some contrast to tell us what the size and shape of this appendage is. We then remove this catheter and place the Watchman device into the appendage. It's a ball. So that ball is atraumatic. So we can advance it, push it, pull it back, retrieve it, and we're putting it back deeper now, replacing it. And as you can see, it's not going to hurt the wall of the appendage because there's no needles or spikes on it. It's like a ball. And then we can deploy it again. And if we like it, we will then deploy it. There's hooks on the device that will actually hook into the wall of the heart. And as time goes on, the body will slowly absorb the, the device into the appendage. And as you can see here, over time, the heart has grown tissue over the appendage. So that becomes a permanent cork over the bottle. And we can exit out here and go back to our slide. So the Washington procedure is performed in a cardiac cath lab by a heart team. It's, again, through the vein does not require open heart surgery. We utilize general anesthesia, and it's usually a one hour procedure and requires one to two days in the hospital. This is the device that I just showed you, which is called the Watchman Flex, which is again, the newer version of this device. So there's much less needles or trauma with inserting this device in the heart. On the left is the device that we utilized prior to the Watchman Flex. And I will tell everyone watching as well, I've been, performed this procedure since its inception in the US, and I can tell you that the changes of this new device are amazing. It's amazing because it's much easier to deploy, much less complication risk for patients, and it fits a much wider range of anatomies. So this is just going a little bit into the data because people always ask, well, why is it work? How do you know it works? Well, there's been thousands of patients enrolled in trials for the last 10 years that show that this device is very effective in patients who cannot tolerate long-term blood thinners. We've seen significant reduction in disabling strokes with utilizing this device when compared to blood thinners. There has been a massively re massive reduction in freedom of major bleeding with utilizing this device. 72% reduction in major bleeding with utilizing the Watchman device. It actually can reduce ischemic stroke when, reduced, when compared to no therapy, but I would like to emphasize, when you're taking a blood thinner, a blood thinner just doesn't affect the appendage, it's a systemic drug. So naturally, if you wanna reduce rates of clot anywhere in the body, the blood thinner is your best bet. The watchman is not meant to say blood thinners are not good. The watchman is meant for patients who cannot tolerate long-term blood thinners. It is the most studied left atrial appendage closure device with long-term data. It has excellent long-term safety data. Who is a candidate for this? Again, do you have atrial fibrillation? Do you have an elevated CHADS VAS score? Do you have a reason not to take a blood thinner? Again, it's not about you telling me I don't wanna take a blood thinner. It's about patients who cannot tolerate taking a blood thinner. And that's very important because, again, the risk of a procedure should never be higher than the rewards of doing it. So if you are to get a watch and procedure, it's obviously for the right reason. Do you have multiple falls? Have you had multiple bleeding episodes or even one large bleeding episode? Are you allergic to the blood thinners? Can you have no ability to check your INRs and can't afford the NOACs? These are important things. Now, I've had patients come to me and say, you know, I'm a professional uh, parachute jumper. I jump out of a skydiver. I need, to be, I need a watchman because I can't be on a blood thinner. To be honest, if you jump out of a plane and your parachute doesn't work, I don't think a watchman's going to help you. So there are certain things to look at. Obviously, common sense being number one, that the device is there for the risk of bleeding, not necessarily to replace everything else that's going on in your life. So again, we need to have an appropriate rationale to seek a non- 
drug really alternative to, warf to warfarin, taking into account the safety and effectiveness of the device compared to warfarin. You need a history of major bleeding while taking anticoagulation therapy, or at least some bleeding, experience with other medications like the Eliquis or Xareltos, and if you can't maintain a stable blood count on Acumidin, that would be an indication as well, or an inability to comply with getting your blood checked. Any medical condition, occupation, or lifestyle placing you at high risk of major bleeding, secondary to trauma. So again, if you're a farmer working in the fields with heavy equipment and you have no you know, ability to get to medical care and there's a risk of heavy bleeding out there, obviously the washroom makes more sense. So at this point in time, when we're looking at this, we do know that Medicare will reimburse for doing this procedure. So I want everyone to realize it's not experimental and you will be able to be covered if you have insurance, private insurance covers this as well. So this is not an out-of-pocket expense. So what we see here, you need to have all the documentation, the AFib history, the CHADS VASC of greater than three. You need to be suitable for short-term Coumadin or a blood thinner for 45 days after the procedure. And again, it's a team decision. We need to make sure everyone agrees that you're suitable for this device. Again, we have operator requirements of people doing these procedures, and I'm proud to say, in the state of Colorado, I'm currently the one proctor for watchmen to train other physicians to perform this procedure. So that's something that I like to tell patients as well, that they understand that I've done hundreds of these, and it's something that, again, we as a team at Boulder Heart do not take lightly, and it's an important conversation to have with not just the patient and the family, but the physicians as well. So we know it's a safe implant to be proven safe and effective, and we do know that it eliminates the need for long-term blood thinners in the right patients. Again, proven to offer stroke risk reduction comparable to warfarin and other blood thinners available, and it reduces the long-term risk of bleeding associated with blood thinners. And questions at this point, we will then open the floor up to questions at home. All righty then, well thank you so much. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful panel, wonderful information. We do have a few questions, and we'll get to those right now. All right. The first question we have is, is there any upper age limit on AFib abulations? All right. Uh, I'm happy to field that one since I was talking about ablation. So, Upper age limit is a little bit of a, a tough question to answer. And it has to do with the fact that not everybody ages the same way. Um, we definitely, uh, you know, I, I will say that uh, we don't see 20 year olds getting AFib ablation. We will very rarely see people in their 30s. Those are clearly outliers. Um, and also, for the most part, rarely see people in their 40s getting AFib ablation. So I say that to say uh, we are very used to this idea of doing these invasive procedures on patients of advanced age because AFib is clearly associated with advanced age. Um, once we start getting into patients who are in their 80s, we start being a little bit more careful, but I think it has more to do with the patient's overall health and kind of their, uh, their reserve, their physiologic reserve. Um, I've personally never done an affibrillation on anybody over 90 years old. Uh, if you twisted my arm and said, is there any scenario in which you might think about doing it? I, it would have to be a very well-selected patient, but I would imagine that that would probably be kind of an upper limit. Uh, Dr. Anderson, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I ag agree exactly with what Dr. Asnerov said. There's not a strict upper limit um, of age, but any procedure does get riskier, especially a procedure under general anesthesia as time passes and uh, along with any other uh, medical conditions. Um, so we, we always take this procedure seriously and give people the best information we can about uh, risks associated with it. And as people enter their 80s, um, the risk of any invasive procedure rises. So uh, sometimes we will um, be more cautious and 
Um, we just, uh, again, what uh, Vitaly was going over, the, sh the idea of shared decision making between a patient and, and a, a proceduralist physician, we give people all the data we can and help them make the decision that's best for them. Can pacemakers cause AFib? Can pacemakers cause AFib? Generally, no. Um, again, I think in, in a very specific situation, hypothetically, you could see a pacemaker cause AFib, but as, as a general kind of, you know, if, if you want a yes or no question, uh, answer, then the answer is no. What is Prista atrial tachycardia? I can. Um, the atria, although there are these chambers that sort of receive blood and help it move to the uh, lower chambers or ventricles, and that would seem to not be that complicated. Both the up, right upper chamber and the left upper chamber or atria are, are very complex structures. Um, and crista is a term for the uh, crista terminalis, which is this ridge of tissue in the right upper chamber um, that it sort of divides this sort of smooth part of the right upper chamber from the rougher part. And that just has to do with how we all develop uh, before we're born. Um, along that ridge, as along many other places in both the right and left upper chambers, electrical sparks can form when they're not supposed to. And those sparks can make the upper chambers beat. And if they beat in an organized way, uh, we call that atrial tachycardia. So that's a crista atach is uh, coming from this ridge in the right upper chamber. And generally, that's a rhythm that we can get rid of with a procedure, an ablation procedure. Can you review once again some symptoms of AFib that an individual might notice in daily life? Sure. Um, the single most common symptom that we see from atrial fibrillation is probably fatigue where they're going about their day, they're able to do certain things on a day-to-day -day basis, go grocery shopping, feel a certain way. And when they pop into atrial fibrillation, they may or may not feel racing or palpitations, um, but almost always people will say, suddenly, things that are generally easy for me to do, walking up a flight of stairs, I suddenly can't do that. Um, people may have a vague sense, like Dr. Asnerov said, that something is not right in their chest. Some people really do feel their chest pounding in an irregular way, but that's by no means all people. So, and shortness of breath is another common symptom as well. Uh, does cannabis affect AFib? So, I will first say that uh, the research on cannabis is kind of, it's, it's, it's a fairly new research field. Um, and so we're learning about cardiovascular effects of cannabis in general. Um, we know that the effects of uh, marijuana are highly strain dependent. It depends on, you know, it's, it's not all THC and it's not all the same amounts of THC. There are a lot of non-THC active compounds that, that may be in the mix. And so, you know, kind of lumping it all together as one substance may be a little bit difficult. Um, we do know that acutely with marijuana use, we do tend to see um, elevated heart rates, elevated blood pressure. Um, we can see uh, something called orthostatic hypotension, where you know you may actually have high blood pressure sitting down, but then you stand up and your blood pressure kind of dips, and you get that tunnel vision thing that we all sometimes can get if we stand up a little too fast, and people can actually have loss of consciousness. Those hemodynamic effects can actually have uh, an effect on atrial fibrillation. We do know that with acute marijuana use, there is a an increased risk. I think it's within the first couple of hours. So basically, with acute effect of marijuana, we do see an increased risk of uh, vascular effects such as stroke and heart attack. Um, some of that probably has to do with smoking marijuana and the oxidant stress that has to do with smoke inhalation as opposed to, say, 
vaping or edibles or things like that. There is an alternative means of getting that substance into the body. So all of those things are potential cardiac stressors. And so if after all of this information, the people in the audience are saying, boy, that sounds more confusing than ever. I completely agree because I, unfortunately, I don't think we can really say that there's any one effect of marijuana on the heart, on the vascular system, or on risk of atrial fibrillation. But we are learning more and more about it um, every day. Um, but yes, I, I think actually one of the things that I do have a conversation with folks about is about at least trying to moderate their marijuana use because um, we know that there is definitely some associative effects. And I also tend to ask my patients, have you found an association personally between marijuana use and atrial fibrillation? And if you have, well, then there you go. There's a treatment target for you. Excellent. Is it AFib if your heart beats quickly when you lay down? I think Dr. Einger had a really good slide on that towards yeah. the beginning of his talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, as, you know, as a non-electrician, I would tell you, if that's the case, then most of us have AFib. No, just kidding. No. <laughs> Having, the truth is, you can have positional changes which cause your heart rate to pick up or slow down, depending on how your body habit is. is. But it's also that, remember we said initially, not every fast heart rate or skipped heart rate is a fib. So that's important to keep in mind. Remember, the EKG is critical to make the diagnosis of a fib. So you really do need to have a, a strip of an EKG to show that what you're going through is a fib. So if you feel that your heart's pounding, skipping, going fast, sure, it could be a number of things, but it cannot be defined 100% by saying you have that, you have a fib. It's not one to one. So you do need the EKG to make that diagnosis. Right. Please get an EKG. Talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this this may be pretty much the same question. Is ablation also an option for people with frequent ventricular beats and runs? Yeah. So ablation is uh, the the term ablation is a lot like the term surgery. Uh, you know, in this conversation, we were talking about AFib management options, and so that's, that's what we talked about was AFib ablation. But ablation can be used to address just about any kind of arrhythmia in the heart along this, you know, there's this spectrum of extra heartbeats or fast arrhythmias. Anything that the heart is beating more than it should can generally be addressed with ablation. Anything that where the heart is beating less than it should, we sometimes want to talk about a pacemaker and things like that. But but for ventricular arrhythmias such as what uh, that person is describing, uh, ablation is a potential option, as are some medications to help control that arrhythmia. How many times can ablation procedures be done, and is it less effective as time each each one happens and as time goes on? So there's, similar to the age cutoff, there's not necessarily an upper limit. Um, and so it's not at all uncommon to need two ablations. Um, even three ablations is not that uncommon. Once it get, gets past that, for atrial fibrillation, I mean, um, there, is, there are diminishing returns. And there are several reasons for that, especially um, we're creating scar in the heart by doing an ablation. Now, when we do it, we're, we're focusing on areas that we want to get rid of and doing it in a very strategic and tested way. The more heating or freezing that we do in the heart, though, the more scar that gets created. And then convert, you can have more AFib or related rhythms. So after someone gets to two or three ablations, uh, we often need to use a mixture of different therapies. There's a surgical procedure that can be done for AFib. Um, there often need to be a combination of medications along with ablation. And it's a, a long discussion we have with folks. Um, so in summary, there's not an upper limit, but it would be unusual to do more than three ablations for AFib. Does plaque cause AFib? So plaque to myself as a cardiologist, what that means is probably vascular plaque is, what, is what's being asked. Um, so vascular plaque in the sense that it can cause 
chronic inflammation that Dr. Anderson was talking about in the sense that it can cause a heart attack that then compromises the heart's efficiency and its pump function and leads to that structural damage to the heart that we talked about as a risk reactor for AFib, then in that sense, yes. Um, is AFib in itself a reason to look for plaque? No, we don't actually think of AFib as what we call an ischemic rhythm. It's not something that actually requires us to say, oh, you have AFib, you must have coronary artery disease, and so we have to do a stress test. Um, so there's not really a direct relationship there, but indirectly through chronic inflammation, through circulating lipids, through epicardial adipose tissue, like Dr. Anderson was mentioning, uh, in that sense, there is an indirect relationship between people's plaque burden and atrial fibrillation. Uh, can the watchman uh, break apart? So the question is, so you said, can the watchman break apart? So theoretically, any device put in the heart, any device, whether it be pacemaker, stents, you name it, there's always a chance of some mechanical issue occurring. Luckily, I'll tell you, I've never seen a watchman break apart. And the watchman itself, when it is placed in the appendage, it's a permanent device. It doesn't come out. It's not, it's not retrievable in the sense that you're not going to replace it after so many years. It's permanent. And again, being like a cork, it's not going to move. You're placing it in a place where it's going to be static. So the likelihood of fracture or movement is very low if it's placed appropriately. So I would say, is it possibility? Absolutely. Any device in the heart can anywhere can have a chance of breaking or loosening or whatever, but I think if it's deployed appropriately, and again, I've never seen it happen in my hands and I've never seen it actually happen where a device breaks off in half or has a hole in it, uh, then it should be fine. And I think that's the main issue is the correct sizing of the device and the correct placement of the device. Thank you. What exactly is a major bleed event? So a major bleed event can be defined in multiple ways. And it's just a generic term, because a lot of patients will come to me and say, I haven't had, quote unquote, a major bleed, but every time I shave, I have to have 17 Band-Aids on my face, or every time I go out and weed the grass, I, my arms are a bloody mess. So I don't use the phrase major bleeding event to actually rule in or rule out any patient for being on a blood thinner or having a watchman. The major issue is this, how is the bleeding affecting you. If you come in and say to me, literally, that every time I pick my flowers and I live for my garden, my hands in the, in the rose bushes are bloody and I can't wear gloves because, again, I need to have some sensitivity or whatever it might, those are patients who I will consider to say, listen, your life is being affected and compromised by the bleeding issues associated with what you want to do. That is a patient that we have to consider. So again, the major bleeding issue was basically brought on by the initial guidelines but it has changed over time. And now we basically view it as a patient-specific situation. It's up to what you are going through. Because some patients will say, I had a hemorrhoidal bleed, but my hemorrhoids were treated, and I don't really have any bleeds anymore. So that patient might go back on a blood thinner. But then when you have a patient who has diverticulitis, which is basically uh, pouches in the, co in the colon or the, or the large intestine, those bleeds tend to recur. So those are the patients where you tend to look at and say, you may not have had a major bleed with your diverticulitis, but you might. And those are the patients we might consider to say, let's get them off the blood thinner and may get the watchman. Does living at a uh, mile high elevation cause or affect AFib? We do see more atrial fibrillation at higher altitudes. Um, so compared to sea level, uh, folks who live uh, at the Boulder or Denver altitude do tend to have uh, more atrial fibrillation. And similarly, our patients who live here, when they go up into the mountains um, at 9, 10,000 feet, uh, may have episodes of AFib when they haven't had episodes of AFib at a lower altitude. What are the long-term side effects of Eliquis and similar drugs? So the, the question was basically, what are the long-term effects, or side effects, really, of being on a blood thinner? So as we were showing earlier, as you get older, the risks of bleeding go up. So that's just an age-derived issue in all of us. And that's something that we have to take into account, because someone who is 50 on a blood thinner 
when you're 75, the risks have gone up just by age alone because the risks of breakdown of tissue in the body for whatever reason, something as simple as my gums were bleeding and being on a blood thinner, that became an ER visit. I can't tell you how many patients who have had nosebleeds just from dry air who are on a blood thinner who are then getting their nose packed with the, these trumpets because, again, it's an age issue. They get, the older they get, the more risky being on a blood thinner is. So that's the biggest side effect of being on these medications. They don't cause the bleeds, but as we all get older, we have more of a tendency to bleed, and being on a blood thinner makes it worse because obviously it prevents you from clotting off. Do you recommend magnesium for AFib patients? So electrolyte imbalances are in general uh, a potential risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And magnesium is actually one of the electrolytes that our bodies use to regulate the other electrolytes. So um, the important thing to understand, though, is that if somebody's not magnesium deficient, supplementing magnesium is not actually going to help. Um, now, in people who are magnesium, potassium are kind of the two big ones deficient, then yes, magnesium supplementation can help. But I, uh, you know, I had a mentor during my training who famously used to say that um, Americans have the most vitamin-rich urine in the world because we all take unnecessary supplements and we just flush it right out. Are there any studies about AFib in vegans? In vegans. Um, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I eat plant-based um, and uh, I, will, I can say this, that um, there are many studies about risk factors for atrial fibrillation in people who eat uh, what is described as vegan or plant-based. And all of the risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation, as well as the risk factors for developing a stroke if you have AFib, are greatly decreased in a vegan or plant-based diet compared to a standard Western diet. So those things include um, people who eat a vegan diet pattern ha have, on average, a healthy weight level, um, a normal BMI, as we would say, a normal waist circumference at a much higher level, very high percentage um, compared to a Western diet. Um, the risk of diabetes is greatly reduced by having or adopting uh, a vegan or plant-based diet. High blood pressure is much lower in those who follow a plant-based diet. Um, and then things like sleep apnea as well. So um, while I don't know of any specific trials looking at, say, adopting a vegan diet in order to modify AFib, I can say that all the ways people get AFib, uh, sort of aside from um, you know, getting older or having a problem with a heart valve that you just were born with, um, are improved by a plant-based diet. Do we know yet how the COVID vaccine affects AFib? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. We know that inflammation, in the chronic sense, increases atrial fibrillation risk. We know that physiologic stress, in the acute sense, increases your AFib risk on a kind of, you know, why did I have this episode today as opposed to why did I not have one yesterday kind of thing. Um, there is some indication that the very robust inflammatory response that we've seen with COVID vaccines, especially with the, um, with the two-shot regimens, um, we do have some indication that that's a strong physiologic risk that can actually set off some of these reactions. However, I will also say that, do you know what's a really big physiologic and inflammatory stress? It's COVID. So please go get vaccinated. Absolutely. Okay, we have time for two, three more. Um, to, to, in your opinion, are Apple Watch EKGs reliable? They can be very helpful. Um, there's an app called Cardia that begins with a K that people buy, and it's a little thing they put on the back of a phone, and it has two electrodes. They put two fingers on each one, and that can generate um, what we would call a one-lead EKG. And the Apple Watch, similarly, can give 
uh, can complete a circuit, as we would say, um, using the watch on the wrist and then you touch the watch with your other finger. And um, when people have arrhythmias, uh, they will often, when they see us as patients, they'll often send us those files. And I find that potentially very useful um, in, in specific situations. Uh, sometimes it's not that helpful and we need more of a, a formal medical monitor that we would need to create an order for, but it, they can play a helpful role in a lot of folks. I, I'd also like to add that the machine interpretation on those can be a little bit spotty, and so I usually, you know, for my patients, I very much encourage them to use wearables to generate data, um, and we can review it either at their clinic visit or if they're having symptoms on a particular day and they say, hey, something's going on, I want you to look at this, so they can send us that EKG, but I also like to um, remind them that, you know, the, your phone is very smart, but it's not as smart as a doctor. So, you know, the EKG tracing is what's really helpful. If your phone says possible atrial fibrillation, you know, we usually tend to take that with a grain of salt until we've actually seen the EKG. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. One last question. Is AFib a symptom of COVID long hauler syndrome? Have you seen? I don't know if long haul COVID has an increased risk of AFib. Um, post viral autoimmune and nervous system disorders, which COVID is now the most recognized one of those syndromes, um, cause a lot of dysfunction of the nervous system and can cause dysregulation of how your blood pressure is able to rise when you go from lying to standing. Um, it can slow your heart rate or make your heart rate be very fast in a, in a kind of normal rhythm, but way too fast for what you're doing. You would think that those kinds of changes could precipitate atrial fibrillation, but I have not seen, and I've been really following this very closely because I have friends and family who suffer from both long COVID and other post-viral immune and nervous system disorders like that. Um, I have not yet seen documented increased AFib, but it wouldn't surprise me if that panned out. All right. Thank you so much.